Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit of background about how the potato genome sequence was generated so that you can interpret it in the right context for your breeding programs. So the potato genome was sequenced by a consortium called the Potato Genome Sequencing Consortium. It was a group of scientists throughout the world that were interested in obtaining the sequence of, of potato. It just got published a month ago. Um, he made the cover. This wasn't maybe the most flattering thing about potato, and that you have chips and fries, and that came out three weeks after you know the the link between chips and fries and obesity was uh, revealed. So uh, anyway, so it's done and it's available, and I'm going to talk to you about how we've integrated this resource into the SoulCat project, which you're familiar with, and Dave will be talking a little bit more about. So I sort of have two hats. I worked on the Potato Genome Project, which was funded by NSF, and then I'm working on the USDA-funded SOLCAP. So I'm sort of the bridge between the g genome and application. So just a little story about how the genome was sequenced. Um, initially, it was decided to sequence this diploid heterozygous genotype. We'll just call it RH. It's a Dutch uh, genotype. They had made the ultra-dense map with 10,000 markers between SH and RH. Um, this was published some time ago. RH was considered to be the least heterozygous of the two parents. And a physical map was made by the Dutch group at Wageningen. And um, Sanger sequencing started. This project started in 2005, 2006. And this was before the advent of really efficient next generation sequencing methods. And we started off with a back by back approach. And the estimation was that we would need to sequence 6,000 backs for full coverage of the potato genome. So the initial strategy was that we're using the RH back by back. Um, it turns out, as we started to collect some of the initial data, we realized that the haplotypes in this diploid were quite divergent from each other. So the first thought was that we'd have two haplotypes. Uh, we'll just call them 0 and 1. We'd chop them up and make a back library. And then we'd sequence them and then assemble back the two haplotypes. Um, that was our, our thought, but it turns out that that was actually very difficult to do because the two haplotypes differed quite a bit outside of the genic region. So the question then was, could we find a homozygous line? And um, this would reduce our assembly issues. There would only be one haplotype that we were looking at, and essentially um, you'd have, the, if it was a double monoploid, you'd have your two haplotypes. You chop them up, and then it would be much easier to put them back together. Okay? So this, this line does exist. This, is, this was made by Richard Vu, who's here. And this is DM13516R44. So it's a double monoploid line um, that comes from group Fereja. Um, clearly has reduced um, complexity for whole genome shotgun sequencing. And David Spooner had uh, uh, put this in um, solanum tuberosum. So one issue about this clone is it grows very, very slow. Um, and this is thought to be because of uh, uh, inbreeding. So in case you've never seen it, this is RH. These are tubers of RH. And this is DM right here. Okay. So we checked the, flows, uh, the size of the genome. It was 850 by uh, flow cytometry, which matched what RH um, was as well. So we set out to have some goals. And I'm just telling you this to just give you an idea. Obviously, this is a draft assembly, but I wanted to make sure you understood that there are missing genes. There are some um, assembly issues. And this is important that you just don't go and obtain the genome sequence and think you know it's 100% it's, uh, perfect. But our initial goals were that we wanted at least 95% of the genes captured in the assembly, including the regulatory regions that we would assess this by looking to see how many of the Sanger Express sequence tags that are already in the public database were present in the assembly. And we wanted 95% of these. And we wanted to have these anchored to the, the uh, chromosomes. So we wanted at least half of the genome anchored. And that would have represented 80% of the genes. And we wanted to annotate the genome for genes. And we asked, I'll go through what a contig size is, this N50. Essentially, we wanted the assemblies to be useful in terms of our interpreting gene structure. So we wanted an, an N50 contig size of 15 kilobases. And so an N50 is where half of the bases would be found in a contig of at least 15 kilobases. And we wanted a scaffold size. And I'll go through the relationship between a scaffold and a contig. We wanted this to be much larger. And we wanted this to be at least a half a megabase. 
So the assembly process, I don't want you to worry about the precise mechanisms of this. What I want to focus on is that you take the reads and you put them into an assembly algorithm that gen then generates first contigs. And so these are, these are smaller, kilobase size contigs. And then you add in some more sequence data, the, these paired ends and these mate pairs, and you build linkages between the contigs to form scaffolds. And then you add in even more information over here and fill in some gaps, and you're ending up with your final assembly, which is called a super scaffold, where you linked the scaffolds together into a higher order of uh, assemblies. So these are the three tiers. So this is the smallest. This gets bigger, and then this will be the biggest unit size in the assembly outside of anchoring it to a chromosome or linkage group. So we did do some quality control to see how good the assembly process worked. We took 10 of the DM back clones that represented about a megabase, and we compared the whole genome shotgun sequence, which is on the bottom, with the back sequence up here. And certainly there are gaps in the sequence, and there's some, some minor rearrangements here or disassemblies. But overall, the sequence between the whole genome shotgun assembly and the backs were quite good. So there were no, mis, uh, no major gross misassemblies. We did another QC where we had sequenced two ends, the forward and the reverse end of a whole suite of phosmid and back libraries. And then we went back and asked um, independently how many of those are in the correct order and orientation and the correct distance. And so what's shown here is that if you take the forward and reverse end sequences from the backs and you ask how many of them are in the incorrect orientation, it's a very small percentage. How many have the incorrect direction? It's a small percentage. And you can look at that at, with the phosmids as well here. It's a very small amount of misassembly. And what's interesting, if you go ahead and look at the RH backs, because we had forward and reverse sequences for those, and you look at them on the assembly, it's a little bit larger, but this is probably because of rearrangements in RH versus the double monoploid. So the statistics of the assembly, this is called version 3 of the assembly. And the take-home points here are is that we were targeting an N50 contig size of 15 kilobases, and we got a, a N50 contig size of 31 kilobases. So this is a pretty reasonable contig size. You know, the average gene is going to be less than five kilobases, so we're going to capture the, the full gene on the contigs. So the N50 scaffold size we were targeting was a half a megabase, and we ended up with a, a, a 1,300 me megabase um, scaffolds, or 1.3 megabase scaffolds. And the total representation of the assembly is 727 megabases. So we're missing part of the genome. That's the most important thing for you to take home. Part of the genome is missing. Uh, most of that that's missing is the heterochromatin and the centromere. So we're missing a few genes, definitely, because there's gaps in the assembly, but the bulk of what's missing is the repetitive sequences in the potato genome. Okay? So one thing that's important for you, this group, is, is that there was no genetic or physical map for the double monoploid, but a subset of individuals in the PGSC formed a mapping group, and what they did was they started to anchor the scaffolds and super scaffolds onto a genetic map. And they used a whole series of markers, SNPs, SSRs, DARTs, and they had a population generated by SIP, a DM, by DM, by DI population, and they started to anchor the scaffolds to the genetic map. So they also used a few other resources. They had a, a physical map from RH, they had some markers from the POMA MO site, and they had some maps that were present in SGN. So pretty much they had experimental data they generated directly themselves, and then they used a suite of data that they collected from elsewhere. And they targeted that they wanted to get 90% of the assembly onto the genetic map. When they finished, they had anchored 86% of the assembly, and this contained 87% of the genes. So one thing that's important that you understand is, is that they've anchored these scaffolds, super scaffolds, onto the linkage map. Um, but this doesn't necessarily mean um, that they're in the correct um, orientation. So they're definitely in, in, in the correct order, okay? But they're not necessarily in the correct orientation. So I wanted to go through a little cartoon of how this is. So if we think of a chromosome right here, and we've got a set of super scaffolds, one black and one red, they could be positioned in order on the pseudomolecules or on the genetic map 
like this. So this would be a head-to-head -head relationship. But if we only have one genetic marker anchoring this, this super scaffold or this super scaffold, it actually could be in a whole different set of orientations. So the orientation, if there's only one genetic marker placing this, it could now be head to tail, um, it could be tail to tail, um, or it could also be um, head to tail in this, this orientation. So that's what's pretty important. If you, we don't necessarily have multiple markers on each super scaffold, we may only have one marker, and that places it in a position, but it doesn't orient that sequence. So it could be flipped around north to south on the pseudomon.